So we could have used this game in 2014. We'll take it in 2018. Should be a good one in Dallas with TCU semi-hosting Ohio State in the first big matchup for both teams here in 2018. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, bringing you the very best from the best bloggers, broadcasters, writers in the industry, the insight, uh, the information, best discussion, debate, and analysis with the likes of Tony Gerdeman from the Ozone to again break down the Buckeyes. Tony, how you doing tonight? Doing pretty good. Thanks for having me on again. Absolutely. You're always invited. You know that. So, um, man, let's, let's, let's start with 2014. I was going to hit that later. Let's, let's go with 2014. So I had a couple TCU guys on during the off season. And as soon as the Ohio state game was mentioned, obviously I know what happened in 2014, but that wasn't at the forefront of my mind. And they immediately went to it as this is a grudge match. I reminded them that Ohio State didn't make the decision. Uh, mm -hmm. Regardless, uh, yeah, they the at least the fan base views it like that. Of course, no players from what would have been that game in 2014 are still around. Uh, but uh, that's the situation from the TCU perspective, apparently. That's interesting because I don't think um, TCU is anywhere near the thought process of Ohio State fans or players players or coaches regarding that 2014 game uh you know once once the Buckeyes got there who who didn't get there you, you're, you're not thinking about and as the team that didn't get there that's all you're thinking about is the fact that you didn't get there but with the Buckeyes winning the national title that year it would seem like they were deserving of being there uh, but I, I don't know that that really comes into play with the players considering anybody who is still around was a true freshman who redshirted that year and really had no input on that game. And the players now would not even be able to really relate to that game because they were in high school at the time. Yeah, no question about it. Just a footnote for the fan bases to get fired up about. And again, as you just said, um, for the, the team and that fan base that lost out, of course, the Venom's mm -hmm. there because that's the target. That's the team that got in our way. And for the team that, that made it, well, they, they aren't thinking about, uh, the, the, again, the fan base, speaking about the fan base, thinking in their rear view mirror uh, because they got the job done. I always felt as though Florida State was the only team that didn't have any type of um, ha had the free pass into the playoff. I don't know why Oregon and Alabama were given free passes that year with one loss. And it all came down to the other three Baylor TCU and Ohio state. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, this Dwayne Haskins kid, um, he can throw the ball around a little bit. I I'm guessing that uh, there's a lot of talk about him around Columbus these days. There is. And I'm now I've been asking people like, is it, okay to buy in already without having seen what he does against TCU because what he's doing right now is pretty remarkable albeit against Oregon State and Rutgers and that's always the, the caveat with how he's playing you know completing like 80 percent of his passes and what has nine touchdown passes and like 11 incompletions this season so he's doing it um, he, he's placing the ball almost perfectly in the rain completing 20 of 23 last week really poor conditions but putting the ball where it needed to be and his receivers were catching it. Um, so at this point, you know, it's he looks how a fantastic quarterback should look, but this will be the true test. This will be the first test, rather, the first real test of a defense that can pressure him. And what little bit he was pressured against Oregon State, I think he was pressured four times, scrambled twice for 24 yards, uh, threw one incompletion and threw one interception wasn't pressured too much against Rutgers because the offensive line picked up the blitzes. So we'll see what happens this week against TCU, which will be from all angles, has some good defensive ends. And if they can get that pressure on him, I think that's going to be the key. How does he react to it? Uh, is he as calm during pressure as he is at every hour of the day? And just how does he respond to any kind of adversity? We've got Tony Gerdeman on the line from the Ozone, the Ozone at dot net. Uh, join him right there. And obviously his Twitter handle and uh, you get the best in Ohio State football coverage. Uh, TCU, of course, Ohio State, uh, the big game on ABC, 830 Eastern time. 
on Saturday night. So we saw the running backs uh, not be given a, a huge handle on the ball and didn't need to in a 52-3 to win against Rutgers. When I checked out the box score, I actually had to scroll down because there were so many players that carried the football that I had to keep going. You usually see like Dobbins, Weber, and the quarterback, mm -hmm. and that's it. Uh, but of course, uh, they had that luxury. Uh, so it gives us little indication to what the game plan is going forward. But in terms of distribution, Tony, what can we expect? Do you think it's the hot hand or do you think it's more Dobbins for a drive, Weber for a drive and back and forth? The way they do it is we'll see who starts. Dobbins started the first game. Weber started the second game after that, you know, 180 yards against Oregon State. And basically what they do is because they're running their tempo, at such a pace, each running back is given about five or six snaps and then they come out. You know, sometimes that's an entire drive, other times it isn't. So it, it really just depends on how the offense is going. And then, you know, they get their five or six plays and then they come out for five or six plays. And then, they, you know, it's that's that's the way the rotation is. It's more about the tempo rather than each possession one guy gets it. Sometimes it works out that way because they only need five or six plays for a touchdown drive or a punt or what have you. Um, but it's more about, just keeping the guys fresh rather than possession by possession. So it, it's, it goes that way until there is a hot hand. And if they want to ride somebody, they will, but you can only ride them so much at the pace that Ohio state goes before you have to replace them anyway. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, breaking down the Buckeyes and uh, the Horned Frogs. Of course, the Buckeyes uh, dismantling Rutgers and Oregon State, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Two consecutive weeks, they got the defense together in a 52-3 to win over the Scarlet Knights, knocking out Artur Sidkowski in that game, the Rutgers quarterback. We got Tony Gerdeman on the line from the Ozone. I uh, want to remind you that I've got a weekly newsletter, The Voice of College Football. Please subscribe to that by sending your email to Mark Rogers TV at Gmail. Stats, trends, facts that you won't find anywhere else. And uh, perspective from myself. And of course, like, comment, and subscribe. All right, talking about the defense, uh, I was pretty surprised to see uh, the amount of explosive plays that the Oregon State Beavers reeled off in week one, considering uh, in my prep for the game and for their season more specifically, that they were one of the least explosive teams in college football in FBS play in 2017. And uh, they were able to rip off uh, big plays. But then again, when it's a 25 to 40 point spread, uh, during the course of the game, you don't know how much to play into mm -hmm. that, but it was good to see the Buckeyes from an Ohio State perspective get it back on defense uh, last week. Yeah, that Oregon State game, Greg Schiano said 82% of Oregon State's yards came on seven plays. And the first real, uh, you know, they had one, uh, one like 49 yard touchdown pass. Basically, every poor play on defense was by a new Ohio State starter, a sophomore. Other than uh, like the first play out of the uh, third quarter after the hour and 20 minute wait, where Artavis Pierce, the running back for Oregon State, ran right into a defensive tackle Antoine Jackson's arms and Jackson let him go and he ran 80 yards after that. So, you know, it's one little play, one, one thing here, one thing there, where the other issue was they weren't swarming to the ball. They got that fixed against Rutgers, but I don't know that Rutgers had the, uh, the speed that Artavis Pierce had, you know, at Oregon State. And they're going to see a lot of that speed this week. And that's that's where you wonder, did they fix the problems or did they just not see the same issues against Rutgers because Rutgers couldn't pose those same problems? And whereas, you know, TCU has size and speed at running back, they've got speed at receiver, and they've got speed at quarterback. So they're, they're going to test the Ohio State defense, the discipline of the defense especially. So you hit on the term that I was going to hit on next, and that's uh, the word speed. So that's what you think of in, in TCU. And it was most noticeable to me recently in seeing the Alamo Bowl against Stanford. Now, Stanford, for being an extremely good football team, is probably at least uh, this is the stereotype. And I think it's true to, to an extent. Uh, one of the slower teams of the top 15 to 20 teams in the nation. And it was there was a significant difference. Now, with Stanford's strengths, they offset that, and it turned out to be a game that went down to the last 30 seconds of the game. It was a two-point game, but TCU did. In space, they made Stanford's defenders on the edge look silly. Um, I'm going to generalize this statement. There might be some differences, and I certainly want you to go there, Tony, if there is, because I've seen this matchup twice in the last 10 years with Ohio State football taking on 
Oregon teams that instead of having to listen to it for a week, uh, the Buckeyes had to listen to it for six weeks that Oregon was too quick and too fast and all this other stuff. But if you'd look in retrospect at the two rosters, there would be no comparison between the number of NFL players uh, on the two rosters. And I would guess that that's going to be the case three to four years from now in looking at TCU and Ohio State. Uh, do, do you find any analogy there? Any comparison? The um, the, the skill at the skill positions, you know, is, is going to be similar. What Ohio State has is speed at every position, you know, defensively. They're not ever, you know, rarely are they going to be the slower of the two teams on the field. You, know, you, you talk about Alabama and Clemson and, and, you know, those are the three programs where the speed is everywhere and, and the speed is deep. You know, it's not just the frontline guys. You know, Gary Patterson said this week that you know even the second and third teamers are parade all Americans. So Ohio State has the speed to match up with TCU's offense for sure, but that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be big hits because TCU is fast as well, and you only need to be out of position a little bit to not be able to, to recover. So that's why it still comes down to Ohio State's defense uh, being disciplined and you know filling the right gaps. And just keying on on the, on the on the right keys is what Pete Werner, their line, sophomore linebacker, said this week. You know, just being disciplined and doing your own job, not worrying about somebody else's job. And they feel that they can cover the entire field that way. And you know, Ohio State has shown they've got the secondary uh, over the years, cornerbacks to match up with receivers that want to come out against them. So um, you know, we'll see. It's gonna gonna be fun just because of the individual matchups. Um, but you know, you get you start throwing those screens around, and with Ohio State's pass rush, and the entire defense is going one way, the offense goes the other way, and, and the guy is gone. You know, we've got Tony Gerdeman on the line from the Ozone. I am uh, checking out the live chat and, and want to remind everyone that we started this conversation just a few minutes after seven o'clock Eastern time. So if you're just joining the chat and, and the numbers are going up, uh, definitely wait for it to uh, process and post. Uh, after we get done with the conversation to catch up with what you missed. So uh, if you have anything for Tony in regards to comments, questions about Ohio State football, uh, then certainly uh, drop them in the live chat. Otherwise, I will let you guys just uh, argue and do what you do and make predictions and so forth. That's great. Love it. All right. TCU speed. TCU offensive line. I think as we tend to do, Tony, with the long, long college football offseason as we look at the big games and we're talking about them months in advance, unlike any other sport, really. And uh, with this one, it was, OK, where do the Buckeyes have the advantage? Oh, yeah, that defensive line against a TCU offensive line that's a bit reworked from last season. And that seems to be maybe still in play. Yeah. And Greg Schiano, defensive coordinator at Ohio State, has been praising the TCU offensive line and saying they look like a Big Ten offensive line. They're big, they're strong, they're fast. But they, they still have, you know, left tackle making his start of his career you know, this week. Uh, they've got some experience at right tackle, got a you know, young guy, new, new guy at center. So there's definitely some rework and there, there's some inexperience there. And that's, to me, that's a bad matchup with Nick Bosa and Chase Young and Draymond Jones and even Robert Landers at nose tackle going up against a young center. He's a really quick guy, you know, gets leverage. He's listed at six one, but he's probably five eleven. So he gets under, you know, every offensive lineman that, that he comes up against. And then they just rotate. You know, they're gonna pay, play, you know, 10, 11 defensive linemen in the game. And, you know, I, I think that's the other part of of this game is they can stay fresher longer, you know, offensively as well. They can, you know, they churn out. They rotate the receivers every five or six plays, you know, just like they do their running backs. So they have this depth of, you know, we'll just, even if, if things are close in the first quarter, they expect things to, you know, grow in distance each subsequent, subsequent quarter and defensively as well with the way, with the way they rotate guys. They have the three cornerback rotation that they've had for a few years now. They've got a, a nickelback that they just started playing last week, Sean Wade, who, essentially gives them a fourth cornerback or a third safety. So they're just really deep and they stay fresh. And I think that'll help them in this one. We've got Ohio State football talk on the line here with Tony Gerdeman from the Ozone. And before we continue on, Tony, uh, let the folks know where they can find you, all the good work that you do there at the Ozone and the podcasts and, and the whole array. Yeah, uh, check us out at theozone.net. You can find us there. I'm at on, on Twitter at Tony Gerdeman. Uh, I got a podcast every Wednesday called Across the Field, where you can find us. And then uh, 
Tom Moore and I, a, a cohort of mine, we do a, an instant reaction podcast, Facebook Live after the games uh, that you can see, you know, immediately, well, immediately after we get out of interviews. And then, um, you know, that podcast will get posted, you know, sometimes Saturday night, early Sunday morning to just, you know, check out on Sunday mornings for the instant reaction from the game. So that's where you can find us. So, Tony, with a reaction that I get from Ohio State fans and, and you get uh, a thousand times more uh, because of the concentration of what you do, uh, they're, they're pretty confident. They, they know the TCU is fast. They're a good team, but they believe they have an elite team, which probably do. And so I'm seeing a lot of 42-17, 45-24, those type of scores, getting into that three touchdown range. Uh, I don't know if you've made a pick. Certainly, if you save that for a certain uh, time of the week, uh, certainly don't. Uh, I don't need you to make a prediction. But are you hearing the same thing? Are you feeling the same thing from the feedback that you get from Buckeye Nation? Yeah, but the, the closer they get to the game, I think the nerves start to ramp up, and you know the 40s become 30s, and you know, you start to clench up a little bit for me. Like I don't have a score yet, but for me to be like a 42, 17 or something, I would need to see, um, better opponents for Ohio state than we've seen. And maybe even better opponents for TCU than we've seen, because we really, I mean, right now, well, every, every pick is almost a guessing game, but this one is, is even more so because we've only seen them play teams that they should have done what exactly what they've done to them. So we still haven't learned a lot other than, yeah, these are two good teams, but we'll see who is the better team because you you think it's Ohio State's favorite. They're more accustomed to the position. Um, but you, know, you see the you know Oregon State had success. Uh, I know TCU fans will point to the Oklahoma game last year as you know an instance of this is what big 12 offenses can do against anybody. And there is, you know, definitely truth to that. So, you know, to be like overconfident or to think it's going to be three touchdowns, it very well may be, but um, I would have preferred to see some other, some more competitive teams, you know, beforehand to start throwing something like that out there. No question. And if TCU fans want to make that comparison, of course, they lost to Oklahoma in the championship game 41 to 17. And the other game in the regular season was similar. So I don't know what they're really pointing toward in regards to score comparison, but uh, that the that that Oklahoma of last year was better than Ohio State. But uh, regardless, it's a it's a fine program. And Gary Patterson certainly doing as good a job practically as anyone in college football to take a program that does not have the pedigree, the track record, the tradition, any of those things, and to lift them to a position where they're typically in the top 15 in the nation is uh, quite um, the the effort by him. Uh, we got Tony Gerdeman on the line from the Ozone. I uh, want to remind you, I've got a newsletter that comes out every week. Uh, we've gotten excellent feedback. We've only been out for two weeks. we got over 60 people on the mailing list, the voice of college football. So get your email address to Mark Rogers TV at Gmail. And of course, like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, for those of you who are coming across uh, my channel for the first time or have only seen it once or twice, check out the videos. We bring on the very best in the industry to talk college football. Have uh, we seen, Tony, any kind of noticeable difference between Urban Meyer on the sideline versus not on the sideline? Has that been talked about in the news conferences? What's, what's been the general feeling? It's... Um... What Ryan Day and all of the coaches have done is tried to keep everything exactly as it was before Urban left so that everything is exactly as it should be once he is back. And he is back, you know, six days a week. Uh, it's it's interesting to see how, um, I guess, more aggressive maybe the offense is without Urban Meyer. You know, last week in the rain, maybe the Buckeyes under Meyer would have chosen to run the ball more or maybe run the quarterback a little bit more. But Ryan Day said uh, on Thursday, you know, he told the team before the game, like, we're still going to go out and be aggressive and we're still going to throw the ball, you know, rain or not, because, you know, they were also expecting the rain to get worse. So they wanted to throw the ball while they could. And it's, you know, when Urban Meyer got to Ohio State, he was viewed as an aggressive coach and he is still an aggressive coach. But I, I think maybe maybe fans and maybe us in the media who have seen him so long have kind of maybe taken it for granted or gotten used to it. You know, the um, 
and, and we see maybe a, maybe a softening of his demeanor in terms of the, you know, destroy all defenses. Whereas Ryan Day, this is his opportunity to showcase what he does and what he prefers. And man, he's, he's knocked it out of the park, you know, even from his first press conference to, you know, you know, Saturday will be his final game as the head coach of our state until maybe, you know, a few years down the road when he is, you know, the, uh, the head coach again at Ohio state, who knows, but this is a, this has been a tremendous audition. And uh, I think it's one that, you know, if all goes well for the Buckeyes on Saturday, fans aren't going to forget anytime soon. Good stuff from uh, Tony Gerdeman. You can catch him on the ozone.net. Uh, Sean Robinson came in as a four-star quarterback. I saw him chip in uh, against Iowa State. It was a game that TCU was upset in Ames against uh, the Cyclones, one of their two big upsets last year. Got into the game. They really didn't give him the keys. They were trying to, to keep uh, the game close, get uh, Kenny Hill back in the game. Uh, really didn't see him do much of anything there. I caught uh, most of the game. Uh, wasn't really scouting per se, but uh, had the game on against SMU. Uh, he's, he's a strong, big athletic kid that can make all the throws. He's got a strong enough arm, but he didn't really show me anything in the SMU game where he was making the type of throws mm -hmm. that you only see a handful of guys in the nation make, uh, those sorts of things. But, uh, have you had a chance to look at, uh, Sean Robinson? Yeah, I saw a lot of the same stuff that you saw in that SMU game where he could be uh, completely comfortable and still throw a pass that's three yards away from the receiver or throw a pass right to a defender. So I think what the Buckeye defense needs to do is take advantage of those errant throws. Um, but you know, talking to the the linebackers and, and the, the defensive guys this week, they know what kind of runner he is. Um, you know, you've got Jeff Okuda, the cornerback at Ohio State, and Baron Browning, the middle linebacker, both played against Sean Robinson in high school, so they're familiar with him. Uh, I, I, one of them was asked, you know, if, if he runs like JT Barrett and they're like, no, he's more dynamic than JT. He can make people move and then run over him. Cause he's like you said, he's a big guy. So it, it's going to put the linebackers in a difficult position and, and, and the secondary as well, because Ohio state is a man defense, you know, so they're going to be a lot of times they'll have their backs turned towards the quarterback and not see him taking off. So they have to be, as I said earlier, disciplined, uh, just read all, all of their keys and then, react once he breaks past the line of scrimmage and then you've got to swarm and, and you've got to get him down. He's going to keep plays alive. He's going to move the chains, uh, but you just can't let him do it all game long. Tony, you know, I love the uh, personnel breakdown. So against Oregon state, um, uh, of course we got into the second half. It got away from us. And uh, in regards to the Buckeyes uh, lead, and uh, wasn't competitive at that point. I'm um, trying to track all the games. So I didn't see either game. Uh, the bottom line story is wire to wire. Uh, too many competitive games out there yeah. uh, for me to stay with Ohio State winning by 40 points. <laughs> but the, in terms of the personnel, it's, it's basically, um, you know, there's such a churn in personnel during the offseason. So who are some of those guys that maybe we talked about during the offseason that uh, you either have a, uh, a plus or a minus next to the name in regards to what you've seen through two games. Some of those guys that we, we didn't know a whole lot about in 2017. Yeah. And I think a lot of that, a lot of those guys are the sophomores. I mentioned that were making some of those mistakes against Oregon state. One would be um, Isaiah Pryor, who is the starting strong safety who had to play free, free since of Jordan Fuller against Oregon state and Fuller back defender in the secondary for Ohio State. So, you know, Pryor had to move positions and was put in um, a tough spot for him in the first career start. And he, you know, they took advantage of him. Now he's more comfortable. He had a, a good week of practice between the first two games. So he, Greg Shiano likes the advancement that he's making and, and he's playing at a position where he's more comfortable now. So that's a guy who needs to continue to play well. Baron Browning, I mentioned that middle linebacker, has been starting for Tough Borland, who started last year as a freshman at middle linebacker and Brownlee didn't have a great first game, only one tackle in the second game. So, you know, he's, he's making the right calls and he's doing that. Well, you'd still like to see more production out of him. So those are two guys that the Buckeyes need, especially this week, because there's going to be some, you know, I, I don't want to say you, know, you think back to that Oklahoma game where Baker Mayfield had the Buckeyes on a yo-yo basically. And, 
you know, they're going to be looking at Sean Robinson with all of these reads. He's going to be reading different players. Um, how, how do they recover when somebody is, when they maybe make a, they're a split second slow on what they're going to do. Uh, there's just, they're going to be very tested and, and it'll be interesting to see how they react. The young guys, uh, you know, Chase Young's another sophomore defensive end. Who's very talented. Sometimes, you know, he got kicked out of last week's game for celebrating too much, uh, was a little enthusiastic on his pass rush in, in week one. So, but this is the third game for a lot of, for all of these guys, these new starters. And, and I think, you know, they're right about where they should be in terms of, you know, okay, we're experienced, we can be calm and still be the, the four to six seconds A to B that Urban Meyer preaches. And as long as they produce, I think all of the veterans will be fine. So we've got two quarterbacks with roughly the same amount of experience. So if they stay on the same trajectory, Dwayne Haskins is basically an elite quarterback and is having an outstanding season. Sean Robinson has been a bit sketchy. I'm sure he'll produce big numbers because they're a, a team that typically nine times out of 12 have the better talent and he's just going to rack up numbers to a certain extent, but he may throw 20 touchdowns and eight picks or something like that. Uh, unless... Sean Robinson turns into what we saw with Kellen Mond, who's like a 50% thrower who played out of his mind against Clemson. And they have similar skill sets, body types, dynamic runners, guys that have been scattershot in the passing game. But suddenly Mond found it and Clemson was uh, on the ropes in the second half. Yeah. And I think that's entirely possible because these are talented players and Ohio State was recruiting Sean Robinson. So they're familiar with him. And, you know, they've got three receivers that anybody would take in the country. And you know, the two talented running backs, you know, one of them 6'3", 230 pounds. So he's not, you know, a guy that you can take lightly, you know, literally and, and figuratively. So there's there's plenty of talent there to, you know, it, make, make turn this into a shootout and, you know, make it a very entertaining game. So with Sean Robinson is just, he can do almost anything. And then he can also maybe just have the game of his life and, you know, you mentioned he wasn't making all of these pinpoint passes against SMU, but sometimes, you know, in a big game like this, you get so focused that you are making those plays. You get into that zone, and sometimes it doesn't matter what the defense does, but then you still have the 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 neutralizing factor of the Ohio State defensive line. At least that's what the Buckeyes are planning on. And while we're talking about quarterbacks, uh, of course, it was in garbage time, but Tate Martell steps in and, and maybe this gives Ohio State fans confidence that if, uh, God forbid, Haskins goes down, that the season's not over. He steps in, he goes perfect uh, through the air and uh, runs for 100 yards. Yeah, and he's the most explosive runner at Ohio State as a quarterback since Braxton Miller, you know, without a doubt. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if he plays in this one while the game is still in doubt. He's he's played quite a bit in the first two games, but they were you know it's Oregon State and Rutgers as we've said all show long. This is this is a different animal. Uh, Ryan Day says the plan is always to play him in every game, um, but if they're down seven nothing in the first quarter or fourteen seven in the second quarter, I, you know I don't think they take Dwayne Haskins out at that point. I don't think they're looking for a boost or anything. I think they just want to maintain and try to just be the Ohio state offense rather than try to maybe jumpstart it with Tate Martell. Um, so I, I, I'm going to be surprised. I'll be surprised if he plays. And if he does play while the game is still in doubt, that should tell you an awful lot about how they feel about him and how comfortable and confident they are. And, and, and Tate Martell has said the same thing. He knows all of, you know, he knows what he's supposed to be doing now. He last year, he didn't, he's completely comfortable in the offense now. And he's, he's a very good compliment to Dwayne Haskins. And TCU is still going to have to prepare for him, whether he plays or not. So that's an advantage for Ohio State as well. I assume you're making the trip, Tony. Yep, heading heading down to Dallas uh, tomorrow night, early evening, and uh, get there late at night. But then we've got all day Saturday to find some good places to eat. <laughs> that's always the uh, mission when you hit a new town. But for you, not necessarily a new town. Dallas has been good to the Buckeyes. Yeah, they have been, and it's um, you know that that's been a topic this week as well, where everybody everybody on the team except for the true freshmen are familiar with it, and you know, it's kind of like an old home, sort of like you know the the Phoenix trips that they've always made in, in you know for both season, 
and they've been out there a bunch. So they're familiar with it. Um, Buckeye fans will travel. You know, I know it's 20 minutes from TCU Stadium, but it wouldn't surprise me to see it at 50 50 because that's just the way um, Ohio State is. Even in real neutral sites, you're talking 60 to 40, you know, 60, 40, 70, 30 Ohio State fans. Uh, this one will be a little bit more difficult to outnumber the TCU fans, but, you know, there are going to be plenty of Buckeye fans there and the players and the coaches know it as well. All right, folks, hopefully you've been paying attention. It's a great insight all the time from Tony Gerdeman when we can grab him here on Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Catch Tony on the ozone.net. Uh, enjoy the trip, Tony. Enjoy the game. Uh, we'll be watching the coverage. All right, good night. Thanks, Tony. You can uh, stick around, do whatever you want. I'm going to take uh, possibly a couple of calls and look at the live chat, but uh, certainly uh, you are free to go, sir. We appreciate it. <laughs> Have a good one. All right. We got 860 uh, 325 3687. So if you want to make any uh, calls into Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, keep in mind that we've got Washington talk with Chris Fetters from Rivals coming up at eight o'clock. So that is only uh, 28 minutes from right now. And so uh, if, if I'm on the line with phone calls, that's great. If not, we'll shut down. We will uh, rejoin everyone at 8 o'clock Eastern time, and you can enjoy the Wake Forest and Boston College game if you'd like. 24-21 uh, Wake. Uh, I've got this one on the DVR and expect to do post-game after either I've watched it or I've reeled in some Wake and BC contributors to talk Boston College Wake. One of these teams in the ACC will move on to 3-0 and right now. BC down three with the ball. They have just started the third quarter, third and 14, and BC completes it for a first down. There you go. 860-325-3687. I'll put the number in the chat. And uh, you guys can give me a call if you'd like. Otherwise, again, Washington talk at 8 o'clock Eastern time. Then we've got Cam Underwood from State of the U to talk of Miami at 9 o'clock and a little bit later tonight, uh, either at the conclusion of this game after or after we talk Miami football uh, with Cam Underwood. We will uh, have instant analysis on Boston College and Wake Forest as one of these two teams in the ACC will be 1-0 in the conference and 3-0 overall. Appreciate you guys jumping on board as uh, Navy Thomas has set me up and promoted on the live chat. Please Join the newsletter if you love college football, if you want some information that makes sense, good stats, trends, and facts, uh, a channel update for those of you guys who really support me and want to know uh, what I'm thinking about going forward in the future and want your input, your suggestions. Uh, I will never clutter up your inbox and I will only send one mailing per week and Maybe we sneak in two in the postseason, but during the regular season, it's one per week. And if it's successful, we'll carry it on through uh, the remainder of the year. So send your email to Mark Rogers TV at Gmail, fair exchange. You've got my email. I've got your email. Send your email to Mark Rogers TV at Gmail, and I'll get you the newsletter. And if you would like the previous two newsletters from weeks one and two, I'll send those out to you as well. So I appreciate it. And uh, again, eight o'clock Washington talk, nine o'clock Eastern with Miami and instant analysis of BC and Wake Forest. We've got betting talk with Steve Merrill uh, coming up at 11.45 a.m. Eastern time on Friday. Also, Claire Crawford joins us for 6 o'clock Eastern time to talk more Ohio State TCU, trying to track down some TCU contributors as well. And I'll share some uh, channel updates and thoughts probably on Monday uh, I'm considering a few changes uh, in content. And of course, I want to share that with you right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. We will see you in about 20 minutes.